It all started in 1558 with Elizabeth I's reign. She would often invite different troops to come through and perform at her court, with Shakespeare's troop being invited often to come and perform. Due to her being such a big fan, Shakespeare even referenced her in A Midsummer's Night Dream, and even wrote a play at her request. The modern day version of this is when the Queen invited One Direction to Buckingham Palace, and they then wrote What Makes You Beautiful. I actually don't know if that's a fact or not. Uh, it probably isn't. Uh, anyways, in 1576, the first commercial theater was opened in Shoreditch. It was known as The Theater. The place got its name because the Burbages wanted people to see this building as a new modern day version of Rome, being a capital for the arts. Due to how far back it was, it's believed a lot of early Shakespeare shows were shown here. In 1594, a duopoly agreement was signed that led to two troops, one of which being a Shakespearean troupe, being under contract to perform exclusively at this theater. It was originally estimated that the total cost to build the original theater was around 200 pounds, which converted and adjusted for inflation is about 100,000 USD today. The theater was closed due to a dispute over the land and then restructured and funded by James Burbage's sons in 1599 as the world famous Globe Theater. This Globe Theater was positioned where it was because the London authorities banned public plays within city limits. This theater was also built by Lord Chamberlain's men, which meant that all of the architectural decisions were made by people putting on the shows. According to our tour guide, who I don't have a video of, but I do have a video of Daniel Radcliffe, said, They created trap doors on the stage to represent hell, and a door from the top of the stage to represent heaven. Our tour guide also shared with us insight as to why the theater was built the way it was. They had balconies on the stage. That is where the rich would sit. Though the view wouldn't be the best, what was important is that everyone could see them. As this was one of the original theaters in London, does this concept translate it all into modern day theater? Think about box seats, perhaps. The shows put on the globe were very state of the art. So state of the art that during a showing of Henry VIII, a cannon caught on fire, burning the entire theater to the ground in 1613. For whatever reason, theaters on fire is a heavily recurring theme in London. I won't mention every fire, but know that in my research, I'm counting at least nine different theaters burning down in London alone. A second Globe Theater was then built in 1614, where it would stay open and successfully run shows until 1642. Out of all things to shut this Globe Theater down, what was it? The Puritans! The political climate was getting more and more intense in the 1640s, which is why the Puritans shut down all theater, banning it not just in London, but all around London as well. According to Chris Hedges, who is the author of Wages of Rebellion, it was banned because the Puritans were afraid of Shakespeare's shows. Sure, Shakespeare had ghosts, death, and witches all over his plays, but this isn't what scared them. It was that Shakespeare's shows hinted at being against modernity and capitalism. They were banned for about 20 years, with Charles II taking the throne and bringing forth restoration and bringing shows back into London. It was during the late 1600s that the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, home of what would be three different theatre fires in the Dorset Garden, were built near London. Another step towards the modern theatre is that women were finally now allowed to play female characters. Before this, it was all men playing everything, and as a tour guide man, who was practically Daniel Radcliffe, said, they'd get little boys because of their higher voices to play the females. Thanks, Danny. Now we'll take a slight break, or as they'd say in the theatre, an intermission, and talk about David Garrick. In the 1700s, David Garrick rose to fame, starting as a mysterious masked man in a play. He wanted to pursue his acting career, but what would his parents think when they found out their son was an actor? He finally broke down and told his parents. He also was offered an incredibly high-paying gig at the Royal Drury Lane Theatre in their company. He took the offer and soon enough was actually running the theatre itself. While in charge, he made a lot of risky business decisions, such as moving the orchestra into a pit in front of the stage, creating some space on the stage in front of the curtain, no longer allowing people to come in and out of the show as they pleased, and then lastly, the most controversial decision of them all, moving the rich from on the stage in the back to the side of the stage. These were the first times these things happened in the theater, and it is thanks to this man our modern day theater is what it is. He is the reason why every February 19th, which is his birthday, I, Bryce Anderson, personally celebrate his life by wearing a mask and nothing else and being a fantastic actor. Welcome back! We'll jump back in 1868. During the 100 year jump, The Beggar's Opera, the world's first musical, premiered in London. Further, the Drury Lane Theater caught on fire twice, and the Royal Opera House had a gas explosion. Because, of course, the Royal Opera House kept their own gas on their premises. What a novel idea, simply too ahead of its time. In 1868, this is when modern day West End began to be established with the new Adelphi Theater. In the following years, five more theaters opened up right in this area. Big shows such as Chu Chin Chow, a show based off of Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, was the most successful production worldwide during the First World War. 
As the city of London got bombed during World War II, some theaters stayed closed and others stayed open in protest. The West End also continued to grow, gaining hit after hit, including an original Agatha Christie mystery, which just ran its 25,000th show in 2012. No Sex, Please, We're British is also the longest-running British comedy on the West End, and that was a big hit. Lastly, Les Miserables, which is the longest-running West End show ever, opened in 1985. London clearly has a lot of ties to its theater, and I'm sure its history will only continue to grow. And it all ties back to William Shakespeare. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye!